But uh, anyway, so Daniel 6, notice verse 10 and verse 11. Now, notice what it says. Now, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, I'll talk about that in a minute, he knows that the writing was signed, he went into his house, he opens his windows, his windows being opened in his chamber, towards Jerusalem, so he's facing most likely east towards Jerusalem. Notice, he does this, he kneels upon his knees, three times a day. So probably morning, afternoon, and evening. He kneels, he prays, and he gave thanks before God. Notice this phrase, as he did a fourth time. Then those men assembled, and they found Daniel praying and making supplication and praying before his God. And then the rest of the story, as we'll see in a moment, that they catch him praying, and because of his prayer and praying, he's going to throw him into lines that will kind of explain how wild that took place. So, the prayer life of Daniel, so key, so key to him living such a, a, a vibrant, victorious, if we, what we call a Christian life, what a, what a prayer life Daniel had. But notice the circumstances this morning when we look at this. So let's pray. Well, amen. So real quick, let me review. We start with Daniel. Daniel, uh, chapter 1, Daniel's a young man taken into captivity. And the first thing, the first uh, principle that we learned in the life of Daniel was that Daniel's priority was to always maintain his walk with God. That was a priority. His priority was his walk with God. So they stripped everything from Daniel. We won't review all of it, but they stripped everything from Daniel. Daniel's stripped from his home, his family, his culture. He's given a new language. They take his name. They take everything that you can take from a young man. But Daniel... He had a, the priority of his walk with God. They took everything from Daniel, but they could not take his walk with God. The second thing that we see is this, is that Daniel had purpose. He purposed in his heart he would not defile himself. And he purposed in his heart he would not compromise his walk with God. He's in a foreign land. Uh, in fact, you know, he could party it up. He could live it up. And he said, I, I, I resolve, I purpose, I will not compromise my faith. I will not compromise my walk with God. And he didn't. What we're going to see is this, is that, that Daniel now has survived. This is going to be the third king. Daniel's in the land at first of Babylon. And under Babylon was a king named Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar dies. His grandson, Belshazzar, takes over. So now there's another king. And Daniel still is in a place of leadership. After Belshazzar, right before he dies... What happens is that the enemy comes, the Medes and the Persians. The Persian Empire comes in, and the Persian Empire swallows up the Babylonian Empire. So now there's a new king, a new king in town, a new kingdom, a new empire. That new empire is the Medes and the Persians. This new king is a king named Darius. If you read the first few verses, you'll see that Darius, he sees that Daniel is, is a wise man. And he wants to put Daniel in power. In fact, what happens is this. There's like 120 providences. Let's put it in today's terms. We have how many states in the United States of America? 50. 50. So let's just say there's 120 states. In each of those states, there were princes. There were kings. There were, if you will, governors. Just like we have governors. They call them princes. So there was 120 states or 120 providences. Over each providence, there was a prince, or what we would consider a governor, who governed over that. Then there were three other men, there was the king, three other men who were in charge over those 120 very powerful men. There were three men. The king decides, I want to make Daniel, basically, in the way we would look at it, I want to make Daniel my vice president. The king says, out of all of these leaders, out of 123 leaders below the king, he says, I'm going to make Daniel the man. He's going to be the guy in charge. He is going to oversee all of the others. Well, this did not go well with the 122 others. The 122 others said, we don't like Daniel. He is not one of us. He is not a Persian. He is not one of us. And we don't like him. And we, so they decided to basically try to take him out of power. 
So if you study, we won't have time to read it, but if you read this, basically they watched his life. They tried to find anything that they could find wrong with him. They spied him out. They watched him. And after some time goes by, they all gather together. All 120, 122 men gather together, leaders, and they said, we can't find any dirt on this guy. We can't even find any deleted emails. <laughs> we can't find any phone conversations recorded. We can't find him talking bad about women. We can't find anything wrong with this guy. I say Daniel needs to run for president, amen? amen. I mean, there was nothing. No, there was nothing. They, listen to me, 123 leaders, literally, they said, we watched him. This guy is a man of integrity. This guy is honest. This guy doesn't lie. And, and his job, he does it well. They could find no dirt on Daniel. Nothing. Nothing. And they said, well, what are we going to do? How are we going to frame this guy? How are we going to get rid of this guy? How are we going to get this guy out of power? You know what they said? The only thing we can find on this guy is his walk with God. He prays and he worships God. So you know what they did? They were sneaky. You know what they did? They created a bill. I'm just putting it in today's terms. They created a law or a bill. And they, you know, the king's busy. King Darius, he loves Daniel. He wants Daniel to be his right-hand man. He and Daniel are close. He loves Daniel. They knew that they had to find a way to slip in some kind of a, a, a bill or a law that would then trap Daniel and get Daniel in trouble. They knew that Daniel wouldn't compromise because they've heard about him and his reputation. They've seen him at work. They knew he wouldn't compromise his walk with God because he had purpose. So you know what they did is they created this law, this bill, and they kind of butter up the king. They say to the king, they say, hey, we're going to make a law that's going to, for the next 30 days, no one can ask any petition or any request they can't pray to another God. They can't ask any request. The only person they can come to is you, the king. And you know that, let's be honest. The king was kind of flattered. They were basically saying, you know what, king? You look at you've done. Look how powerful you are. Look at your kingdom. 120 providences. Look at you. You're the man. And they start buttering up the king. And the king's being flattered. And they say, you know what we should do? We want to honor you. And so we're going to make this bill. We want to pass a bill that goes throughout the entire kingdom. And that if anyone asks anything of anyone else other than you, then they're going to be thrown into a lion's den. Well, the king's kind of like, well, well, I know I'm kind of important, you know. You know, I mean, I know I'm big stuff, but, well, okay. Not even thinking about it. He's being flattered. He's being deceived. He signs off on the bill. He signs it off and he seals it. And you know what the men do. These 122 other men, the governors, princes, the other two men who were right below the king, like prime minister, you know, secretary of state, they're sitting there going, yes, now we've got Daniel right where we want him. So if Daniel prays, think about this, he prays, he gets thrown into a den of hungry lions. He gets eaten alive. It's interesting because we just read this passage that the Bible says that when Daniel knew the writing was signed, he knows the writing is signed. What does Daniel do? It says he goes into his house he opens his windows. He doesn't go in hiding. He opens up his windows. He faces Jerusalem just like he has always done, the Bible says. He kneels upon his knees three times a day. He prays and he gave thanks before his God. And then the Bible says he makes supplication. It means the idea is urgent prayer. He knew he needed God. He knew he needed God. Daniel could have closed his doors. Daniel could have said, well, I'm, just, I'm not going to pray like I usually pray. But Daniel, you talk about a man of courage. Daniel takes a step of faith and he says, you know what? I'm going to keep praying like I've always prayed. I'm going to keep doing what I've always done. Because I, and the Bible tells us later, and it says this because he believed God. 
He trusted God. And he believed God. You know, I don't know about you, but if I knew that if I were caught praying that I was going to be executed, that would be a challenge. Well, I could just pray in secret and no one will know. Let me put it in today's terms. Even you public school students, and I'm talking to myself, when we're in a restaurant, are we ashamed to pray? When you're sitting at the lunch table at school and everyone else is around you, you're getting ready to eat. Are you ashamed to pray? Can you pray? Or do you do what some people do? Maybe what Daniel could have done. Daniel knows that the writing is signed and he knows people are watching him. Maybe he could have went, <clears throat> Amen. <laughs> you know, you're sitting there in public and you take out the napkin and it's like, in Jesus' name, Amen. <clears throat> <laughs> Could have got away with it. Courage. Courage. Courage to stand up for the Lord. Courage to walk by faith. Courage to not compromise. To say, I'm not ashamed. Daniel had this courage. The Bible says he knows that the, son, the writing was signed. He knows that the bill had been passed. He knows that there's nothing that the king will be able to do to stop it. And Daniel still prays. Puts his faith and trust. Puts his life in God's hands. It says, I'm in your hands, God. He opens up his windows. He kneels down. He prays. Three times. It must have been the third time that he's praying. These men knew when he was going to pray and where he was going to pray. The Bible says that all of them show up and they catch him praying. There he is. They grab him. They bring him to the king. The king is angry. The king's upset. The king, in fact, if you study, read the chapter, maybe later today or this week, you read a chapter. The king, from the moment they catch him and bring him to the king, you know what the king does? He basically seeks out the lawyers. He seeks out other leadership. He spends the entire day doing everything that he can do within the law and within the powers of the law to free Daniel. And, the, and it's very clear. The king cannot go back on the law that he has signed. There's an old saying. It's, you know, the, 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 my dad used to say it. It's the law of the Medes and the Persians. Once it's passed, you can't stop it. The king could not stop it. Not even the king himself. As you study this passage, what you'll find is this, is that the king says, well, do you think your God will save you? Surely your God will save you. The one that you've served continually all these years, he will spare you. He will save you. The king will save you. The, your, your, your God will save you, the king says. Daniel says, I don't know, king. So you know what happens? You, you know the story, but it's a powerful story. Daniel gets thrown into the lion's den. The king's there. They seal it. The king has to put his seal. He has to spend the night in the lion's den. The king, the Bible says, goes back. He's upset. He's angry. He's pacing. The Bible says he can't eat. He doesn't let anyone come in and play music. He is disturbed. He is distraught. He's terrified. He's in fear. He's thinking, what is going to happen? What is going to happen to Daniel? Is God going to spare Daniel? Will God spare him? Next morning, as the sun is rising, the king runs down to the lion's den. You read it this week. As he runs down there, he says, Daniel, Daniel, are you in there? Did your God, did your God save you? Did your God spare you? And Daniel says, it's awesome. I read it this week over and over again. And Daniel says, basically, you know, king, live forever. It's all good. The angel, God has sent the angel, his angel, to close the mouth of the lions. What did it look like in that lion's den? When Daniel gets thrown in there, the lions are roaring and growling, and all of a sudden, the angel comes and closes their mouths. You know what I really think? I really think that by the time the king showed up, picture Daniel laying on these lions, just like sprawl out, you know? Like big fluffy pillows. Can you picture it? Can you picture it? I think, I know this. God has a sense of humor. I, thought, I think Daniel used the lion as a pillow cushion. And he's laying there and he's like, 
Oh, you cute, you dude. <laughs> you just so cute. The light goes. <laughs> and it's about. <laughs> this story is just so cute. Oh. oh, you know you want to keep me, but you can. <laughs> you know, can you picture this? I picture this. I've seen Daniel now like at total peace. Like, dude, this is awesome. And what's even greater is this, that when the king comes, and when he opens up the door and he says, are you alive? Daniel, are you in there? And Daniel says, listen, God sent his angel, close the mouth of the lions, and God spared my life, and God heard my prayer. You know what happens? The king says, get out of there, Daniel. He pulls him out. And he says this, he says, bring every single one of them, every one of them, 122 men that had a plot against Daniel. He says, and bring them and their families. And he threw them into a lion's den. And the Bible says that every one of them was crushed before their bones, their bodies hit the ground. The people who set out to destroy Daniel were destroyed themselves. Whole well, other lesson, but may I say this? What goes around comes around. In the scripture, the law of sowing and reaping, what you sow and what you do to others or what you attempt to do to others will come back to get you. Then the king says this. The king says, you know what? There is no God like Daniel's God. By the way, doesn't this remind us of what happened with earlier with the, a previous king? This king now says the same thing. He says, there is no God like Daniel's God. And he makes a law. And he says, no one can speak evil of the God of Daniel. And he says, you need to worship this God. And there's like a revival, if you will. Like there's this great revival that takes place. Because Daniel had courage, and the Bible says that God sent the angel to protect Daniel because he believed in his God. Because Daniel took courage, and Daniel was willing to not compromise. He had purpose. He purposed that he wouldn't compromise. But may I also say this, that God answered Daniel's prayer. Because when Daniel went there to pray, listen to me, he said he made supplication. That word is the idea of emergency prayer. God, I need you to do something here. I am in trouble. The prayer life of Daniel. Just a thought or two about this prayer life of Daniel. The first thing I think about is this. His consistency in his prayer life. The Bible says he opened up his windows as he did a fourth time. He was a man of prayer. Three times a day, as he did a four time, it was something that he did. He had scheduled prayer, scheduled time where he got along with God. He had consistent prayer. Work. Three times a day. The Bible says this. Jesus said men ought always to pray and not quit. First Thessalonians, the Bible says uh, to, to the Apostle Paul, Paul says pray without ceasing. Daniel was a man of prayer. He had scheduled prayer, consistent prayer, constant prayer. He, he prayed as Jesus said, pray always and don't quit. And you know, there's times where we want to give up. And don't quit. What, what struggle are you going through right now? What, what are you battling with? What struggle? What, what is it that maybe you're tempted to just quit praying? Keep praying. What is it that you need? What, what is it that you need God to do? Trust God. <clears throat> Daniel did. It looked really bad. Can I say this? Sometimes when you do the right thing, it appears as though things are even going to get worse. Like if you really think about it, Daniel was doing the right thing. He's praying. He's talking to God. And all of a sudden, he goes to talk to God and he's going to get thrown on a lion's head. And I'm sure Daniel's probably thinking, Lord, I'm doing the right thing. What I do right, look what happens. We sometimes think like that. We're human. We say, I'm going to start going to church. Or I'm going to start living for God. And then when you do, all of a sudden it seems like all oh, hell breaks loose. Absolutely. You know why? Because the devil's fighting you. The devil's fighting Daniel. Here Daniel's going to be placed... Think about it. He's going to be put in a place of leadership, a place of prominence, a place where he can reach more people. And the devil didn't like it. The enemy didn't like it. The adversary didn't like it. And so there was an opposition. 
but we see that God is faithful. Amen? And that God has stepped in. God intervened. So we had a consistent prayer life. He prayed morning, noon, and night consistently. But notice this thought, the power of his prayer life. He was delivered from the lion's den. He was delivered from the plot of his enemies. You know, there is power in prayer. Prayer Amen. works, guys. Prayer works. It really does. I'm telling God answers prayer. You know, the last thought that really hit me, that is this. Is this phrase just really hit me when I read this? Daniel knows the writing a sign. Daniel knows that if he prays, he's going to lion's den. That he may literally be eaten alive. The Bible says this, that he kneels three times a day, he prays, and don't miss this, he gave thanks. He gave thanks. He was thankful. He prayed and gave thanks to God in the midst of that trial. I don't know about you, but to me that's like, wow. Because I'm going to be honest. If I, if I knew that I'm praying here and I'm, going to be, I'm facing the firing squad or I'm, fa I'm, going to, I'm possibly going to die, I don't know about you, but I don't know if I'd be like really very much in a thankful mood, right? Right, you know? It's kind of like your car just gets totaled. Yeah, you're thankful you live, whatever. But your car gets totaled. You're not like, hey, thank you. I'm just, thanks God, my car just got totaled. Awesome day. Come on now. Just found out I have cancer. Woo, yeah, praise Jesus, got cancer. That's not, that's not how we roll, am I right? That's not really how we work. You get the unexpected bill in the mail. You know? Oh, thank you, Jesus. No, we don't do that. I'm going to Kids, come here. I'm not very thankful sometimes. Daniel, man, he, let's be honest, he kind of, he convicts me because under everything he's going through, he gives thanks. I close with this thought, and that is this. That Daniel really knew the true essence of what prayer really is. Prayer is a time that we worship God. Prayer, do not miss this, prayer is not always about just us. It's about you see, when Daniel bowed to pray, it was a time of worship. It was a time of fellowship with his God. And in spite of all the circumstances, he realized, he knew this, this truth, and that is that prayer is when we come before a holy God, and we adore him, and we honor him, and we worship him, and he gave thanks for who God was, for who God is. And he gave thanks to God and a spirit of praise and adoration. <clears throat> you know what our problem is? That many times we come to our Father, our Heavenly Father, like spoiled, rotten little brats. And all we do is we have our list. And Lord, do this and do that. And I need this and I need that. And, this, and that's what we think prayer is. We think that prayer is, and don't take me wrong here, but this is a lot of times what we think prayer is. We think that God is this genie in a bottle. And that when we pray, we come and prayer is rubbing the genie, rubbing the little bottle, waiting for the genie to pop out and say, okay, what is it that you want? And I'll give it to you. That's not what prayer is. Prayer is when we come and we worship the holy God. And we spend time with Him. In the Old Testament, the Bible says this, that prayer is like a sweet smelling essence to God. Have you ever heard the term incense? You know, maybe we light candles. My wife has these candles, and she, now she does these oils. And she diffuses them throughout the air. And I have to admit, there's times I walk into the house, and I smell this, these oils being diffused throughout the air. Oh, it smells so good. 
There's times I walk in the house and I'm like, man, the house stinks. <laughs> Honey, you need to do that thingy thing that you do over there, that, that water oil thing. You need to kind of diffuse. Woo, what's that smell? And it's probably because Makai just, you know, dirty the diaper, you know? I'm like, oh, we got to do something about that. We like candles. I don't know about you, but I love this time of year when you come home and you smell pumpkin pie. The oven. Thanksgiving time, oh. Or one of my favorite smells, when you smell the turkey in the oven, oh. So good. It smells good. How about this? Brownies. Mm -hmm. So we bear witness. Amen. You come home and you smell brownies or you smell cookies and you walk in and immediately you're hungry for brownies, right? Last night we had the trunk and treat out here. There was that barbecue truck there, and the guy's like blowing that barbecue smell at me all night. And I'm like, I gotta get me some of that. <laughs> Dude, I saw people standing there, that smells so good. Well, I, oh, I'm like, I know. Here's the point when we call out to God, He breathes in. There's something awesome about that. Daniel knew that. Daniel knew that when he called out to God, when he talked to God, that when he prayed, that God delights in it. Can I say this? As we finish this morning, when you call out to God, when you spend time with Him, when you pray, even in your time of need, or maybe just a time of thanksgiving, that literally the God of heaven, He breathes in and He delights in it. You know why? Because He delights in you. He loves you. And you are his child. And he enjoys our fellowship. So when Daniel went to his father in prayer, he went with a spirit of thanksgiving and praise and adoration because he knew this, that prayer is not just about his own needs and what he wants, but that prayer is about him, our Heavenly Father. When we pray, listen to me, it's not always just about us, but it's about him. And all God's people said this morning. Amen. 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 You stand and pray with me.